Okay. Can you hear me all right? Good. So, Pao asked me to give uh, an overview of testing general relativity using EMRI observations. So, this is really the space time mapping uh, stuff that several people have mentioned so far. So, I'm going to start with a brief description of extreme mass ratio in spiral waveforms. Uh, both Kurt and Leo have mentioned this already, so I'll go through that fairly quickly. I'm going to talk then about how we might test relativity, whatever uh, testing means in this context, using extreme mass ratio in spiral observations. I'm going to talk about something we call Ryan's theorem. Uh, this was uh, work done in 1995, uh, which set the foundations um, for this whole program. And I'm going to talk about some more recent work on the possible imprints of excess uh, multipole moments on the orbital dynamics and also the gravitational waveforms that we might see with LISA. And then towards the end, I'm going to talk about um, issues that are sort of very pertinent in how we might detect um, deviations from uh, general relativity uh, or black hole hair in real observations. And assuming we can make these detections, how we might interpret these observations uh, astrophysically. So lots of people are working on this now. It's a very hot topic. And four, well, I think myself, five people are giving uh, talks during the, this meeting. Um, Chow Lee, Ilya Mandel, Costas, Klempadokas, and Enrico. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his surname, so I won't try. Uh, they're all giving talks on Thursday and Friday. So as Kurt described this morning, um, well, extreme mass ratio in spiral waveforms are very complicated. Um, the extreme mass ratio ensures that the inspiraling body over you know, time scales of several orbits acts effectively like a test particle in the background space time of the central object. When an EMRI orbit uh, enters the LISA band, it's typically still eccentric. Uh, this is under the sort of classical picture in which particle is captured by two body relaxation processes in a stellar cluster around a uh, central black hole. Um, and the orbit is also inclined with respect to the spin of the central black hole. Now, this means that even on a geodesic, the orbit is exploring a significant amount of space time. When you then add on the effects of in-spiral um, over the duration of a LISA observation, which could be as long as the LISA mission, three or five years, um, the inspiring body you know, explores a large amount of the space. And the waveforms that are emitted trace this underlying orbit. So typically, we expect to see about 100,000 waveform cycles. So there's, in principle, a lot of information um, about the space time. As uh, Leo was saying, GD6 and Kerr possess a complete set of integrals. Uh, these are the energy and momentum, which are conserved quantities for any axisymmetric uh, space time. And there's also something called the Carter constant, um, which is a constant of separability of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Uh, Carter showed that this existed in 1968. And it allows you to reduce the GDC equation to a set of ordinary differential equations. Now, this all means that the motion is triperiodic. Um, as Kurt said, it's triperiodic in this uh, MENO time. Um, but this means that the observed waveforms will also be triperiodic. There are three frequencies, one associated with the radial motion, one with the motion in uh, theta, and one with the motion in phi. Um, so in more kind of classical terms, this is the orbital frequency the frequency of the perihelion precession, and also the frequency of precession of the orbital plane, which comes about from spin orbit coupling. And the waveforms we see from the MRIs are strongly colored by all of these effects. Uh, this is a sample waveform. Um, it's actually one of the numerical huge waveforms, uh, but it's quite similar to things that Leor and Kurt were showing. Um, you see modulation due to the spin orbit coupling. Uh, you see bursts of radiation from the whirl phase. When the, uh, this is the extreme perihelion precession when the particle is close to the central black hole. And then you see a lower frequency uh, component when the particle is zooming out uh, towards apex. If you do um, um, a Fourier decomposition, even for a circular inclined orbit, you see many harmonics of uh, the frequency. As Kurt said, uh, we know that the waveform will consist of uh, harmonics of these three fundamental frequencies, but you actually get a very complicated structure. And the frequencies of these harmonics and their relative amplitudes all encode information about uh, the space-time. 
If we have an EMRI into Kerr, which is our basic model, all of these features provide information about the spacetime. Um, simplest terms, they measure the mass and the spin, uh, the parameters of the orbit. Um, and you know, as Kurt was saying, we can measure these things with unprecedented accuracy. Typical, um, typically sort of a part in 10 to the 4 for the mass and spin. Now, if we actually had a system that wasn't a curve black hole, uh, something different, then in principle, the in spiral of a you know, uh, small body into, in this um, space time would give you a different waveform. And the details of that waveform would encode, in principle, a map of the space time um, that the particle is moving in. So by comparing what we observe, with our theoretical waveforms for in spirals into Kerr and perhaps in spirals in, in other space times, we can test in principle whether this central object is really a Kerr black hole or whether it's something else. So this is similar to um, geodesy, which is when we map the motion of satellites around the Earth in order to probe the multipole structure of the uh, Earth's gravitational field. Um, but we, in black holes, we either call it bothrodesy from the Greek bothros, which meant sacrificial pit in ancient Greek. Uh, but apparently in modern Greek it means something more like cesspool, and so many people prefer to call it holy odyssey. Now, is this really testing general relativity? Um, in short, no, uh, but kind of. So, in principle, what we're really mapping out is the metric of the space time, G mu nu. But any metric, in principle, is consistent with Einstein's equations. Einstein's equations relate uh, the metric to the energy momentum tensor of material in space time. So if we evaluate a metric, we can compute what the uh, Einstein tensor is, and that tells us directly what the energy momentum tensor is. Now, in that sense, we're not really testing GR. But we can test aspects of relativity theory relating to massive objects. This energy momentum tensor we produce uh, from some arbitrary metric won't necessarily be physically reasonable. We have energy conditions in relativity that tell us that what energy momentum tensors are reasonable. Um, if we sort of did our calculation and thought that this and found a matter distribution that was entirely unstable, we might think that that was a very unlikely uh, physical situation. And so it's more likely to be something else uh, that's generating um, the waveforms we're observing. The other things we might be able to do are test the black hole no hair theorem. This is basically the idea that, uh, well, the proof that uh, black hole space times are uniquely described by the Kerr metric. That means that everything is uniquely defined by two parameters, the mass and the spin, and all the other multiple moments are determined by those two. If we measure, see, a space time um, in which we have multiple moments that deviate from uh, the Kerr metric, then it might tell us that the black hole no hair theorem is wrong. Uh, more likely, we might be able to test the cosmic censorship hypothesis. The black hole no hair theorem relies on the fact that there's a horizon in your spacetime. If you had a naked singularity instead, then there is no sort of requirement on these multipoles. Um, but then we believe uh, in, well, many people believe in the cosmic censorship hypothesis, which says that every singularity in the universe will be closed in an event horizon. So if we, um, we can either regard observations of uh, multiple moments that deviate from Kerr as tests of the no hair theorem or of tests of cosmic censorship. Um, now in principle, as I'll talk about later, we might also be able to see signatures of a horizon in our observations, and that would help distinguish these two cases. The other thing we can do is explore the matter content in the vicinity of massive compact objects. We know that um, astrophysical black holes will have, uh, are not clean systems. There will be material in an accretion disk, uh, and then maybe other bodies in spiraling at the same time. And these things might also leave imprints on the waveform that we, uh, in principle, could extract. And we could also probably test GR. Uh, one example would be testing that the metric is really Riemannian. Um, another possibility would be to test GR against specific alternative theories. You uh, can use the uh, parameterized post-Newtonian formalism um, to do uh, these sorts of, sorts of tests. Yep. 
you may. Uh, yes. So uh, that's also true. Um, yeah. Um, so I mean, if that's exotic, well, there will be. I'm going to talk about this a bit later. Um, if the central object has a horizon and it has multiples that are inconsistent with Kerr, then we're testing the black hole no theorem. If it doesn't have a horizon, um, and then and it's an extended matter distribution, maybe a boson star or something then we'd probably be able to see the imprint as the uh, inspiring particle passes within this material. Um, if it's a naked singularity, then essentially the orbit will, just keep, uh, will have no evidence of passing inside the matter distribution until it gets very close to the center, and then we might be uh, seeing a naked singularity. So in principle, Uh, yes, I agree with you. I shouldn't have you know, been so yeah, general in my statement. Okay, um, so Ryan's theorem. Um, in this seminal paper in 1995, Fintan Ryan demonstrated that um, if you had an orbit in an arbitrary spacetime, a spacetime that was actually symmetric but had arbitrary multipoles, um, if you had an orbit that was nearly circular and equatorial, then the multipole moments uh, were encoded in things that are, in principle, gravitational wave observables. Specifically, he showed that the energy spectrum, uh, delta re upon mu, this is the total amount of energy radiated in gravitational waves uh, when the orbital frequency changes uh, by unit in the log. Um, and the precession rates, this, uh, the two precession rates I mentioned earlier, the precession of the perihelion and the precession of the orbital plane, or the radial and vertical epicyclic uh, frequencies. Ryan demonstrated that these things uh, were to be written as functions uh, of the orbital period, um, and that if you wrote down your arbitrary metric for a space time with um, uh, any multiple moments, if you uh, then evaluated these expressions for the precession rate um, and for the precession rates in the spectrum as functions of the orbital period, the different multiple moments of the space time enter a different orbit. And so in principle, if you observe omega p as a function of omega, you can uh, read off the different multiple moments. So this idea led to um, testing the Nohair theorem, because as I mentioned earlier, the, for the Kerr metric, all multiple moments are determined by uh, the monopole and quadrupole moments. 
Um, that's the no, hair theorem. So specifically, uh, ML, these are the mass multipolar moments, plus I, SL, SL are the current multipolar moments, are given by M times IA to the L. So if you measure the multipolar moments, um, we can and we can test to see if they're consistent with this uh, hypothesis. If the measure multiple moments um, or not, then we know we have something that deviates from the Kerr metric. In the simplest case, to since the Kerr metric is, is determined entirely by the ma uh, mass and current monopole moments, all we need to do is measure the uh, mass quadrupole moment, and we can do a test to see if it is the Kerr metric. A spinning boson star. Um, this would be one of the models in which you have an extended uh, but very compact central object. Um, the multipolar moments of the exterior space time are determined by the first three moments. Um, so if you measure four, you can rule out spinning both on star model. Now, Ryan's theorem, although uh, yeah, very sort of powerful in principle, uh, was somewhat limited in its scope. He only considered orbits that were nearly circular and nearly equatorial. And he only considered space times in which there was no horizon. In principle, we can generalize this theorem to arbitrary orbits. And in pr uh, this gives us even more information. As I was saying at the start, uh, a generic orbit explores a huge amount of the space time um, on the geodesic. And as it in spirals, um, it, you explore a huge amount of space time. So there's a lot more information in principle encoded in these waveforms. The influence of the horizon uh, also leaves some kind of imprint on the orbit. I'll talk about it again in a moment. Um, and so if you include the effect of tidal coupling, then again, that's an extra probe um, that will, in principle, imprint itself on the evolution of the possession rates and can be extracted from this information. Uh, now, Chow Li is going to give a talk on uh, Thursday, I think, um, on generalizing Ryan's theorem to arbitrary orbits. The prime problem with Ryan's theorem is that though it tells us the gravitational waves encode the multiple moments, it does not tell us how we can extract that information. So our key observable is the number of cycles the fundamental frequency in the waveforms spends near a particular value. Uh, and this is given by F squared DEDF over DEDT. Now, DEDF is something that depends only on the properties of the space time. Um, in terms of the, the metric of space time. The DDT depends on um, wave generation in this arbitrary space time. And to compute DDT for an arbitrary metric is a non trivial task. The other limitation of what Ryan did is the fact that this multipole decomposition is quite an inconvenient way to characterize space time. Simply because Kerr, which we believe to be the space time that describes most massive compact objects in the universe. Um, actually has an infinite number of multiples. Okay, so they're all determined by the mass and uh, mass and uh, current monopole moments. But if you write down a sort of generic space time, if you want to actually uh, describe Kerr, you need to include an infinite number uh, of these multiple moments. So an alternative way to tackle this problem is um, to consider space times that occur but for small perturbations. And then you can formulate the observation of an extreme mass ratio in, in spiral as a test of the null hypothesis that we're observing in spiral into Kerr. By constructing space times that occur plus a small perturbation, we can then uh, do analyses that um, tell us how big a deviation from Kerr um, there could be in that particular space time to still give us um, an ob uh, a detection that was consistent with uh, an inspiral So there are numbers of ways you can construct these um, bumpy space times. The first people to look at this were Torrance and Hughes, and they just did a perturbation of Schwarzschild. Um, you can also use exact solutions. There are things called the Michael Novikov space times, which uh, have the curve and Schwarzschild as one limit. Uh, but by cho choosing um, other parameters, you can give them arbitrary multiple moments. Um, and Ilya Mandel is going to talk about these uh, again on Thursday. Um, and you can also use quasi-Kerr solutions by perturbing Kerr. Um, and Costas and Enrico are going to talk about this later in the week. So these perturbations can either be generic, um, or you can 
uh, consider things that are astrophysically motivated. For example, an accretion disk. We can then investigate properties of GD6 and in spirals in these very space times to see what we might observe um, and what we could detect in an actual lethal observation. But we do have this uh, same problem when it comes to computing uh, in spirals because we then need to understand um, gravitational wave generation in an arbitrary space time. So the way we are currently trying to make progress is using uh, post Newtonian models and also kludges um, just to get some handle on the situation. So the fact that the equations of motion in Kerr separate uh, was somewhat miraculous in a sense. Uh, Carter found a family of space times in which um, the hamilton jacobi equation separated, of which Kerr was one, but this was kind of uh, fortuitous. So you might not necessarily expect this to generalize. However, when we examine the properties of orbits in uh, these various families of Bundy space times, you actually find that they do all possess an apparent third integral. And if you do a Fourier decomposition, you find that they're triperiodic to high accuracy. So the only imprint, in that sense, of a uh, perturbation to the central object, object is uh, the changes in the orbital frequency and the possession frequency um, and the orbit, orbital coupling frequency. So in principle, this allows you to apply Ryan's theorem um, and use the precession rate and uh, uh, as a function of orbital period to extract the parameters. Now what we also find is that in certain cases, you can actually lose this third integral. So as Mark Freitag uh, showed in his talk, in these triaxial potentials, you have many orbits that are box orbits and they look fairly regular, but you can have orbits that are stochastic. You find similar things in the relativistic case, um, although in general most orbits are triperiodic, you can find orbits in which there is no third integral. Um, and so an observation or something like that would really be a smoking gun for the fact that we didn't have a Kerr space time. You can see the effect uh, in an, this is a Poincare map. Um, Ilya Mandel again will talk more about this on uh, Thursday. But if you have an orbit with a third integral, you expect a closed curve in. Um, the Poincaré map, whereas if it's uh, stochastic or ergodic, you expect to, it to fill up the whole space of possible orbits. If you take a Fourier transform of the waveforms in these two cases, if you have a regular orbit, one that possesses a, uh, sorry, this is actually the orbit itself, um, you s the regular orbit, you can almost see the periodicities in it. The ergodic orbit has uh, really quite a large amount of variation. If you take a Fourier transform, you find that you have discrete frequency components as you have in Kerr. Um, but if you had an ergodic orbit, you'd get a mess. Um, and so in principle, this is something that could be observable if it did happen. However, in general, this occurs in regions of parameter space that aren't really accessible uh, in Inspire. And Elio will talk about this more as well. If the third integral was lost, if the uh, time scale of which the orbit wanders due to the absence of this third integral is shorter than the radiation reaction time scale, then in principle we'll be able to observe this in our gravitational wave uh, emission. For the majority of orbits, uh, as I said, they're triperiodic. And so the quadrant moment only uh, appears in its effect on the three frequencies. If you just took two, if you knew what the parameters of the orbit were, you can compare uh, the same orbit. You could say, well, we know that in Kerr, this orbit has a particular precession frequency. In this other space time, it has this slightly different precession frequency. And so we'll be able to detect it in a time that's basically one over the difference in the frequencies. But observationally, we don't have any information about the system other than the gravitational waves. So we don't know what the orbit is. Um, and in principle, errors in the other parameters can um, make up for deviations due to perturbations in the quantile mode. So, for instance, if you uh, quadrupole moment perturbed your perihelion precession frequency, you could get a, you can match it back onto a Kerr orbit by changing the eccentricity of your orbit. Um, and the spin orbit frequency, you can match by perturbing the inclination. Now, what breaks the degeneracies is that we have in spiral. So, in a sense, we have these frequencies as a function of time. Um, and to incorporate this properly, you need to compute errors, parameter errors using the Fisher matrix formalism to allow for correlation. If you do this for, um, well, and evaluate it for the Kerr orbit, 
you can quantify what you mean by a null hypothesis test. You can say, if we observe something that's very consistent with the mean spiral to occur, then how large a quadrupole moment could it hide, in a sense? The difficulties arise in computing accurate in spiral waveforms, since we then need to model the wave emission in an arbitrary space time. So, Bernard's point earlier is a very important one, but it's something that's very difficult to uh, actually address um, in practice. Um, as Leo said, we've only recently been able to evolve uh, generic orbits properly in Kerr, um, and so to do it for an arbitrary space time uh, is a difficult task. But we can make some progress using these approximate models. Ryan, in fact, used a post-Newtonian model. Um, again, this was a nearly circular equatorial orbit with you know, space time with arbitrary multipoles. And he found that for a LISA observation of a year with signal noise ratio of uh, 100, you could measure the quadrupole moment to a part in uh, to about 1%. Now, the curve value for the quadrupole moment is 0.64 in the same units, and so we could definitely tell if this deviated from the curve. In fact, Ryan, by including all these arbitrary multipoles in his model, uh, you could show that up to seven of them could actually be extracted. So that certainly allows you to distinguish a black hole from a boson star or from something that's neither of those. Ryan's model, which was circular and equatorial and in a stationary phase approximation, was very simple. You can make it more complicated, and if you do that, you find the results are even better. Uh, Kurt mentioned one um, uh, calculation, and they find by perturbing the quadrupole contribution to their analytic kluge waveforms, they find that you can measure uh, the quadrupole moment perturbation to the perturbation or the actual value. Delta Q over Q is, yeah, okay. Yeah, so you can get it to uh, a fraction of a percent over one year. To, so, Kurt and Leon's model is one kluge approach. Um, the other kluge model we're using is based on the numerical kluge. We combine GD6 dynamics in these arbitrary space times, Manko, Novikov, and so on, and with, uh, with a flat space gravitational wave emission formula. Now, we find that these things are very powerful. Um, and surprisingly faithful in uh, studies that occur. So we hope that we're capturing the main features um, when we use them for these arbitrary space times. Now the reason for doing as many different possible methods um, that we can, and always sort of trying to do the same thing, i.e. add a quadrupole moment and work out how accurately we can measure it, um, is if we have many different approximate methods and they all give us approximately the same answer, answer that suggests that we are at least capturing uh, the essence of the problem. The other thing that I mentioned was that you can probe the horizon. Um, the plunge frequency indicates that the horizon exists and where it's located. Um, if, if the in-spiral plunges at a different frequency, then the horizon's in the wrong place. If it never plunges, then there is no horizon, uh, very roughly speaking. But the horizon also interacts dynamically with the inspiraling body. The gravitational field of a small object raises a tide on the horizon, uh, and this has a back reaction on the orbit that influences its, its motion. Now, you can model this in the Tchaikovsky formalism, um, in some sense, as an energy that's being lost into the horizon. But you can take a Tchaikovsky-based model and consider a phenomenological uh, variation of it, in which you basically adjust the ratio of the energy that's going to infinity and the energy that goes down the horizon. So this is just the strength of the horizon interaction. Um, and if you do this, you find, again, by doing a Fisher matrix analysis, you can, um, in principle, distinguish Kerr from something that's quite different from Kerr, i.e. which has no energy loss down the horizon. Um, but again, this is a very sort of simplified model. So now I want to talk briefly about how we might detect these things in practice. So Kurt talked about this this morning, so I'll go over it, uh, the first part quite quickly. Our best methods for detecting EMRIs at the moment are based on match filtering. Um, events are typically very faint, a factor of 10 below the noise. Um, and so what we need to do is compute the overlap of this noisy data uh, with a template that models what's in the uh, data stream 
and if we happen to get it right, then we you can't see this very well. You pull out the uh, the waveform parameters. Now, if we have something that's not Kerr, how are we going to detect that? So it's difficult to detect, well, certainly to detect large deviations when we're using a template-based search. Because in principle, you know, we can only see things we have templates for. So if there's something in our data stream that was very different from a Kerr in spiral, it'd be very hard to detect it if we're only using Kerr-based templates. So one approach would just be to stick with Kerr templates and only regard our observations as hypothesis tests. Okay? And then we can do things like these Fisher matrix analyses to say, well, if it was, if we observe something that gives us a very good overlap with a Kerr in spiral template, how much could the multiple moments differ from Kerr and still give us the overlap we see with uh, that particular template? But you need to be specific about what alternatives you are constraining in this way. And it's very difficult doing this to detect something that's completely unexpected and therefore which would be very interesting. Another approach would be to do something entirely kludgy uh, or phenomenological designed, like for instance, for Ryan's uh, approach to extract specific multiple moments. Now to do this, it probably increases the combinational cost. It also makes interpretation complicated. And the other main problem is that if you're trying to generate something that will detect in in spiral in a space time with arbitrary multiple moments, it reduces your efficiency for detecting what we're actually expecting to see, which are inspired into Kerr, because Kerr has to be described by an infinite number of multiple moments. Now, that's not to say we couldn't use a combination of these two. Have a Kerr search, which we expect to see standard uh, Kerr in spirals, and something more phenomenological, which is looking for uh, bumpy space times. The other possible approach would be to hope that we detect an in spiral when it's close to Kerr. Asymptotically, many of these space times may look very much like a Kerr metric, and we only see these bumps and the deviations and the presence of the matter when the particle gets close um, to the plunge. So if that's the case, then in principle, we could uh, detect the in spiral when it's um, in its very close to Kerr phase. If we measure the parameters accurately enough, we can then say what it should look like for the rest of the in spiral, and then look for that in the data. If the source vanishes at some point, or deviates from the track we expected to follow, um, or indeed if it persists when it should have plunged, um, then we can have some constraints that this system is not uh, Kerr. Now this might be one case in which um, the uh, protected observing would be relevant for EMRIs. If we've detected the EMRI and we know it's going to enter the last week before plunge, a particular time, we may want to ensure Lisa is taking data for as much of that time as possible in order to be able to check that the end of the in spiral is consistent with what we think uh, it should be. The other method that may be plausible that has been explored is time frequency techniques. So as Kurt mentioned this morning, you can probably detect uh, in spiral in terms of Kerr um, at two, maybe three gigaparsecs if you make ideal assumptions. In principle, if you do a time frequency analysis, you see a clear track, you can extract the frequency components, you can extract how these evolve, um, and how the power varies along the track. And in principle, these properties, uh, well, these properties will evolve in certain ways if it's a Kerr EMRI, but if it's something that's not, um, then, yeah, again, that's a test that it's not a Kerr in spiral. And in principle, you can use the change in the evolution to do some kind of space time mapping. Uh, now, one way this could certainly work would be to identify the time of plunge. Um, and if the orbit did enter one of these ergodic phases by chance, then you might be able to see that in a time frequency analysis. It's also one way to detect something that is entirely unexpected. But the main problem with the time frequency approach is source confusion. As Kurt was saying, we have several, well, really several million white dwarf binaries. Um, in the LISA data stream, we have probably several supermassive black hole in spirals. We may have 100 uh, EMRIs. And so if you just do a time frequency analysis on the raw data, it's going to be very difficult to extract information from it because you don't, won't have a clean set of tracks. Uh, they'll overlap in time and frequency. And you won't, um, so for an EMRI, 
you actually see multiple tracks corresponding to different harmonics of the frequency. Um, and you need to be able to, so you get more information if you can identify these three tracks together. But if you have a very confused uh, time frequency plane, it makes uh, things like that much more difficult. Assuming we do make observations, we detect an excess multipole moment, then how do we interpret it? There could be several things that give rise to it. We could have astrophysical hair, so other material in space time, in the disk or something, could change the multipole structure of the system. And this is um, something Enrico will talk about on Friday. Uh, though their results suggest that unless the accretion disk is very unphysical, it won't actually make a significant imprint on the spiral. We could have something that's an exotic object, consistent with general relativity. It could be a black hole. It could be an extended, very compact object, like a supermassive boson star. It could be a naked singularity. Um, we could have an object that has hair that's consistent with general relativity. If you have uh, solved relativity in higher numbers of dimensions, uh, you the no hair theorem no longer applies. But we could also have the case that general, theory, general relativity is the wrong theory of gravity. Now this is probably the much harder one to rule out because in the space of all possible theories, um, you know, how do we test all of them? Obviously we have very good constraints on relativity already, um, so we can just construct models uh, which deviate from GR, but are consistent with all our existing observations, and test those. But I think this type of test is the most uncertain at the present moment. We have to be careful to distinguish deviations from relativity from astrophysical effects. Um, for instance, you might have a system with an internal quadrupole moment, because you have a naked singularity, or an external quadrupole moment that's arisen from the presence of an accretion disk. But these sorts of things should be distinguishable um, from how the inspiral is formed. If there is external material, as the particle gets closer to the center, it moves inside this material, and so the orbit will then be qualitatively different. If it's an internal quadrupole, then it's always going to be inside the orbit, and so um, the qualitative evolution will be different. We also want to say something about the horizon, probed hull coupling. This epsilon model in which we just modify the uh, flux of energy that's going down the horizon is a good straw uh, man to probe you know, in principle to say how well we can do. But to actually decode information about the tidal coupling, the polarizability of the horizon and things like this requires um, more complicated methods and some kind of understanding of waveform generation and arbitrary space times, uh, maybe even arbitrary uh, theories. If we had electromagnetic counterparts, it would, it can only help. Um, so, because an electromagnetic counterpart will give us uh, a distance measure, and that will make it easier to use, for instance, the energy spectrum of a diagnostic. But it's very unlikely in practice. Uh, as Kurt said this morning, for a standard MRI, you expect to get the sky position to about an accuracy of two degrees. Um, and there are many galaxies in Three, two degrees on the sky. The other issue is our ability to perform this null hypothesis test depends in some way on how well we know the MRI gravitational waveforms in Kurt. The self force formalism, as Leon said, is getting to the point where it will compute waveforms. But as he was saying, you know, there are these issues of conservative correction, uh, second order uh, perturbation theory, um, the spin of the, of the in spiraling object, and things like this which we may not incorporate in, the, in our family of waveforms. Um, and so we have to understand how failures in the model that we do understand could influence our results as well. But one way we could make statements is if we use the set of all observed MRI events. If you see a single event that's inconsistent with an inspiral event occur, then it might just be an observational error, some astrophysical effect, or a rare object. If many or all of our events are peculiar, then that might suggest some kind of uh, failure in our understanding of massive objects. So I've got some outstanding questions here. Many of these are uh, on the sheet for discussion later in this week. Um, for some of these, we have partial answers. 
One outstanding question is what is the optimal detection strategy? As I said, there are, you could make some progress with time frequency methods. You could use purely Kerr uh, waveforms. You could try and use phenomenological techniques. Um, so we have some ideas of how these things will perform, but we need to look at what's going to give us the most information. Do we only look for Kerr EMRIs and test them for consistency, or do we try and expand our search so we can cover more exotic possibilities? Is there anything that's a clear signature for a deviation from Kerr? So something like the loss of the third integral would be a clear signature, but um, it's unlikely that we'll actually observe that in practice. But is there anything else that would um, be a sort of smoking gun for a deviation from Kerr? This the third question, at what level can we a test GR, is something that we already have some answers to. We know from Kurt and Leo's work that the, uh, you can measure the quadrupole moment to a part in 10 to the 4, um, but that's in the context of one particular model. As we explore more models, we can make sure that this uh, part in 10 to the 4 number is accurate. Um, and we want to figure out how generic a statement can be made. In other words, are we only considering deviations that arise from very specialized uh, models, or are we really considering the class of all possible uh, deviations? Can Lisa distinguish between deviations that arise from the environment versus those that arise from deviations in relativity? Uh, this answer to this question is likely to be yes, but can work more what it needs to be done. How does adding the possibility that there's an excess multi moment affect our parameter estimation accuracy? So I asked Kurt about this, and they have some results. Um, if you have only, if you use only an, uh, a Curry MRI model, you can estimate that the mass will be measured to a part of the If you then add in an excess quadrupole moment to your model and do the same Fisher matrix analysis, you find that yes, you can measure the quadrupole moment to a part of the four, but your accuracy for measuring the mass degrades by a factor of 10. Um, and so we need to, well, the danger is if you add too many excess multiple moments in your model, do we find that you can't measure any of the parameters? Now, so that's very unlikely to be the case. Uh, we should be able to measure the standard parameters with uh, good accuracy, uh, but we need to understand exactly you know, how these other multiple moments uh, will affect the statements we can make about astrophysical parameters. And then this key point is how does our ability to make statements degrade when we make LISA more realistic. The models we've used so far have been uh, one or two EMRIs in a clean data stream. Uh, we do allow for the white dwarf uh, binary background, but we don't account for uh, residual noise that you get from not extracting supermassive black holes accurately, um, the confusion background of EMRIs, and so on. And so our ability to make statements will degrade to some extent when we make LISA more realistic. Um, but the yeah, question is exactly how how much. I'll finish with uh, my summary. Um, in principle, EMRI events are very powerful probes of space-time. But decoding the map is difficult in theory, and is made more difficult by uh, the fact that LISA data is noisy and contains many, many sources. It's likely that using some kind of template-based method or a time frequency analysis, you will be able to extract some information and probably see the signature of a deviation from Kerr. And we can certainly make statements about the consistency of the observation within spiral of Kerr. This is the null hypothesis test again. But if we do see something um, that differs significantly, we have a very unique probe of strong field, uh, I shouldn't really have said black hole space time, so I should really say massive compact object space time, because um, if we, in principle, we could detect a boson star or something else. But in principle, we will make sort of powerful tests of general relativity in this uh, strong field region. So there will be talks by Enrico, Costas, Chow, and Ilya uh, on Thursday and Friday, which will go into more detail about some of the things I've talked about today. Thank you. Continuing in the fine tradition of uh, excellent review talks. Take time for questions, Michael. Um, you were commenting on the, um, the environmental effects, for example, if you have an accretion disk around a yep. black hole. 
Um, how can you distinguish between an accretion disk and, and a non-relativistic, uh, a, a non-care geometry? Well, um, so there are two sort of main ways. First is, well, I guess, uh, yeah, so the accretion disk will be exterior to the, the massive object. So as the particle gets closer to the central object, it will pass inside more and more of this material. But if it was a non kerr central object, the chances are the, uh, the bumpiness, the quadrupole perturbation would be uh, um, concentrated with the singularity. And so you wouldn't actually see this change uh, in the imprint of the quadrupole as you got closer. That's one way. The other way is sort of reasonableness. Um, Enrico has done some calculations on uh, the effect of, well, the imprint of a accretion disk on an in spiral. Now you find that if you use any sort of astrophysical density for the accretion disk, the imprint is uh, negligible, so it's undetectable. Whereas you could, in principle, have a much sort of greater energy density in a sense in your perturbation if it's in the central object. Sorry, just to follow up. Um, so it seems that a lot of the um, uh, information that we get uh, comes from the last orbits. You know, we have to get very close to the to the uh, black hole. I asked a question earlier about the statistics, the demographics of these sources, and I was told there'd be roughly on the order of 100 emeries uh, with the signal noise about 35. I know I'm not going to hold you to that, but my question to you is, are those 100 going to inspire within the next few years, or is that just the total population, some fraction of which will inspire within, let's say, a five-year observation period? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying we will not detect any... Oh, that do in spiral. So that, yeah. that, okay. So let me... I, I guess... I, I'm not sure that the communication was clear there. Okay, well, then it, was, it wasn't to me, so let me just ask a question to, so that I can fix it in my mind. Um, there will be 100 plunges in Lisa's three-year mission. Right. Is that, is that the statement? Is that statement correct, Kurt? In spirals. So not, but not all of those will plunge in the three-year mission. Uh, that was... That was Ending in plunge. Okay, so there will be 100 plunges in the three-year mission. Okay. Okay, but I think that was that was right. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll work my way around. Just to clarify the sense of some of your outstanding questions. Can you at this stage suggest any scenario of LISA observations and inferences that would cause the majority of relativists to give up general relativity as opposed to saying there's astrophysics, exotic objects, or errors in observation or data analysis that are causing deviations? No. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that enough? I just, I just have a comment. I'm sorry, related to Bernard's question, which I'll restate maybe badly, which is that you know, how we would like to, re we'd like to say really carefully what we're testing. For instance, if it's not just the orbit, but how the the waves come out and things like that. And the analogy I like to think about is say, is from the the, the binary pulse, the radio binary pulsar community. So every couple years or so, Wolchan or Joe Taylor comes up with a new paper which they call test of general relativity, and what they really test is consistency. From, from the perihelion precession and the Shapiro delay, they get an E dot, a P dot, and they put it on the curve, and they notice the data is used really well, and everyone says, that's a great test of general relativity. And they've never once said, you know, what the alternative models are, or if general relativity were wrong, maybe that would have affected the way the radio waves come out. They, put, I mean, they don't think about any of those things, and the community is really happy. Right. 
Well, if we could test Brand's Dickey theory the same way, but, but you, Bernard was thinking of a much more general kind of framework than just a one little extra theory, I think. And, and I think if we just hold ourselves to the same standards as, say, the radio pulsar people, I mean, it only is a problem if it turns out that, that Q is way, way off. If Q is, as, as a, if you know, we measure Q to 10 to the minus 4 and it lies right on the curve, then we, I think we just all go we're really happy about it and, 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 and torturing ourselves to figure out, you know, whether exactly what, you know, what it mean in other theories, maybe it's not worth it. Well, I was wondering what you were thinking about that anyway. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree with what, what Kurt said, that, that um, if we get consistency, then, then there isn't um, uh, a case to answer. There isn't a huge amount of extra work to, to do. And, but the point is that the consistency is, is a model, uh, is not just with a theory. It's with a model that has a, a black hole at the center and uh, compact objects falling in and so on. The, the, um, the fir it seems to me that the, it would be very, very interesting. And the first thing we would do if we saw an inconsistency is we'd look for exotic matter to replace the black hole. And we'd be testing to see if the uh, if the signal disappeared because the thing plunged across a, a horizon, or if it just kept going to higher and higher frequencies because it spiraled inside some sort of boson star, these things would be very very clear signatures, and so you'd get really excited. Maybe not about general relativity, but you'd be really excited right away about some exotic physics, which would be just as good, you know, just just as important. Um, I was trying to address in my my question. Um, the this rather subtle distinction between um, mapping the, the, the metric of the background space-time and understanding whether we have the right theory in terms of generating the waves that, that come from the, from, the spir from the in spiral motion. And um, I've thought about it a little during Jonathan's talk is, 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 is what would be a, a, a simple, a sort of a, can I, can I give an example of, of what we might be able to recognize as a deviation in the theory as opposed to just some strange kind of metric that might be accounted for by exotic matter in, in this space-time. And um, the, um, uh, so, so imagine that the right theory of gravity was a scalar tensor theory of gravity of some kind. And we had a neutron star that we were watching plunge or spiral around. So it had a scalar field. Black holes, un unfortunately, radiate away those scalar fields anyway. So it's these tests are not very good for black holes. But we had a, an EMRI based on a neutron star, which had a scalar radiation. Then that ra then it's radiating scalar gravitational waves, which our detectors respond to as well. Um, we could, in principle, see a signature of that in the, in the radiation pattern coming off of the orbit. So the orbit might be a standard Kerr orbit, but because it's going around in some funny way, and changing its orientation, it sweeps its radiation pattern across our detector. And a scalar radiation comes out with a different pattern than the, than the quadrupole radiation of, a, of a, um, a standard general relativity. So even if, we, even if we could somehow fit the orbit uh, to some mass of the particle and some curve parameters, the amplitude of the radiation wouldn't fit. The amplitude would, would be different because we'd be getting, we'd be sampling a, a scalar amplitude as well as the tensor amplitude. So, so there is in principle, a, 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 you know, at least for that particular case, there's in principle a distinguishing signature. If we saw that signature, we would get you know, excited about, uh, we, we, we'd get worried, but in the end we'd get excited about the theory of gravity. Pretty soon I'm going to insist that everybody get on one side of the room. <laughs> to comment on this question of is there any Emory observation from Lisa which would cause most relativists to abandon Einstein's equations, um, it seems to me the answer is clearly yes. If we saw a small object spiral into some orbital frequency, spiral up in frequency, but then not go any higher and just continue orbiting at that final frequency, it'd be pretty obvious that this isn't general relativity at work. 
that the thing isn't plunging, that it's, or, that it's orbiting, that the orbit isn't decaying. Um, related to this, um, the binary pulsar analysis has definitely been done in alternative gravity theories. There's a fairly concise description of this in Clifford Will's book, Theory and Experiment in Gravitational Physics. My recollection is there's a, there's a detailed analysis for Rosen's bimetric theory as well as for Brand's Dickey theory. Um, these theories all, of course, have to have weak field limits that match general relativity to agree with solar system experiments. But in the strong field regime, they can be very different. In particular, just the fact that the orbit shrinkage rate matches the general relativity to prediction to within an order of magnitude is already a very significant statement because that effectively tells you that you're looking at a, a quadrupole effect, not a dipole effect. Lots of other gravity theories predict dipole gravitational radiation. Some of them even predict, predict have the opposite sign from relativity, that the system gains energy. Um, so and one can do very clear tests here, and, the, and the, strong, the stronger the field regime, the more interesting the tests get. When I was talking about the binary pulsar, I was talking about the observations I really wanted to focus on, so yes, so in the past, they've done a great job of ruling out other theories. But all other theories are now basically ruled out. So, 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 uh, so, so I was talking about the, what the papers that are written this year and next year and the next year after, they don't, I don't think they concentrate very much on ruling out Rosen theory because it was ruled out anyway. So I was thinking of the, I was thinking of the, of the current papers where you don't have a good alternative, but you nevertheless you keep plotting and checking consistency. That's why I, I made that analysis. Let me let me take a moment to ask a couple of questions that um, that occurred to me during during um, Jonathan's presentation. So, one set of questions it, it, it's really a set of questions, and at at some level the questions are how accurately can the moments be measured. But let me cast it in a in a physical uh, sense that's apropos of this discussion of testing alternative theories. Let's suppose that we add an R squared term to the action. So we have an R squared gravity and there's some dimension full parameter there in front of the R squared term. Um, and uh, we can look for and find uh, axisymmetric um, space time that is analogous, stationary and axisymmetric that's analogous to Kerr. And let's just do circular orbits in the equatorial plane and ask the question, what kind of bound could we place on an R squared term? Is this a calculation that you think we're in a position to do today, rather than worrying about the bumpy black holes and the whole thing? Um, well, so first of all, this is kind of another thing that's in keeping with the spirit of doing the null hypothesis. Um, and I think it's certainly Well, except he here, here, here's a situation where you have two different, you have two different models, albeit they're hierarchical models. Uh, yes, but yeah, I mean, you were saying, well, you wanted to put a bound on the size of the yes, R right. Um, so yeah, I mean, we need to. Well, I'd say no, we're not in a position to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but. I think the time scale on which we could do it is short. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Well, I, I would think that an important question that's related to all that we've talked about here is the question of, so suppose that we do find that things are consistent at the level that we're able to measure them. Um, what does consistency tell us? Pardon? But an upper limit on what? That, well, but I guess, so that, that comes back to the question, what is the scale of the deviation or the nature of a deviation that, would, that we, would be, we would be bounding or limiting? That is, um, to what degree are we testing relativity? If, if so let's use the word loosely. Yeah, well, this is why, I mean, we need to be clear about when we make statements that it's consistent mm -hmm. with relativity. You have to say, well, in what context is it? Mm -hmm. So we can do this bumpy black hole stuff. We can add perturbations at quadrupole order, uh, octopole, and 
and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we can make statements if you see something that's been spiraling to occur, then it could have hidden a quarter pole moment of one part and ten to the four, an octa pole moment of whatever, and so on. Um, well, let, let, me know, let, me, let me try cast. Let me try casting it another way. Let's use. Let's use again the the binary pulsar. If uh, tomorrow um, the uh, the Australian group finds that in fact they do see a deviation, one can, without having an alternative model of gravity, one can characterize that as. Uh, deviation from the slow motion, you know, from, from the general relativistic slow motion approximation and say that, well, you know, we looked at the, we looked at the quadrupole, we looked at the, uh, at the octopole and so on, and there's clearly a deviation here and it is characterized by an excess in the energy loss or something. Can we do something like that in this case? Um, I don't think that's clear at present. Um, I would think we can make generic statements, but uh, we need to Yeah, but I, when I go to the grocery store, I don't buy generic cornflakes. I mean, I, 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 I mean it's you're asking me what we know now. Well, we I, 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 I want to so know what's in the box, I guess is the question. Not, 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 not a great comment. I think if you show you can fit the uh, predictions to a fraction of a cycle over 10 to the fifth cycles, that's a very quantitative measure. And I think most people would conclude that, therefore, there aren't any big errors in general relativity that are going to affect much in astrophysics. I think this is the bad way. And, uh, uh, before we carry on here, uh, and people get very tired, I, uh, I would uh, prefer that uh, we do now the splitting. So that again, remember that uh, the X satellites, <laughs> one, two, and three, are now the group A, which 